After the 2022 Premiership, the Cats dropped out of the eight for the 2023 season, which led most pundits and footy experts alike thinking that 2024 would be yet another drop-off. Maybe regather their youth, send their champions off in style and rebuild under a new age with Chris Scott. However, the Cats have taken that theory and blown it to pieces considering that they are four and zip to start the 2024 season. So with just one year removed from a flag so far, Geelong can't win the flag. Or can they? So looking at their four results so far, I think they've been good without being great in significant moments. They have had their times where they've been amazing, don't get me wrong, but it's not as if they've had four-quarter domination, which actually makes these results a bit more impressive. Their second half against the Crows was magnificent, as the first half was relatively even. I thought they were awesome against the Hawks in that first quarter, and then all they had to do was just fight momentum which they did magnificently. I thought they were okay for the majority of the Saints game as well. And against the Bulldogs, they were better for just a little bit longer. They've been able to concede huge midfield numbers to opposition teams throughout the season, but they haven't been hurt by it. In fact, they've been really good at being counterproductive and being able to kill teams post stoppage. Their midfield numbers, especially their clearance numbers, don't scream off the page. But the most important aspect that you got to think of when you imagine the best midfield groups in the competition, your Melbournes, your Port Adelaides, your GWSs, your Gold Coasts, a flurry of others as well. It's not that Geelong have got the group or the midfield group to compete with those guys. They don't. If you were ranking the best midfield trios in the competition, Geelong would not have a top six group there. But they don't have a bottom group either, numbers-wise. They are around the seventh to ninth mark for nearly all clearance numbers, which is fantastic because post-stoppage, they are probably the second best team in the league behind GWS. But don't take my word for it, let's check it out together. So they're first in meters gained and second for meters per disposal. That's already incredible. Every time they've got the ball, they want to take territory. And the reasons why this is so important is going to be a key theme a little bit later on. But the fact that they are not chipping the ball around and taking their time, they are wanting to take territory. And the biggest reason for that, that doesn't correlate to what I'm going to talk about later either, is very simple. And that is, is that there is always a player at the next kick. So wherever the ball is, you can guarantee that Geelong are not only set up at the point where the ball is going. So say Tom Stewart is kicking the ball to the wing. It's two on two. Reese Stanley and I don't know, Tanner Bruin are in the two-on-two two via an opposition ruckman and an opposition midfielder. Now, if Ray Stanley doesn't take the mark, Tanner Bruin will hopefully be there to win the ball for the Cats. And let's say they do. Stanley doesn't take the mark, but Bruin finds some space post-contest. The Geelong are going to be set up down the line. There is usually going to be a half-forward flanker, a Grian Myers or a Brad Close, or even a Jeremy Cameron at times, leading up at Tanner. Now, what that does is that draws their opponent up to the kicker as well, which means there is going to be space behind when you think of the other forward flanker. So if Myers is leading up at the ball, you might have Brad Close, who is 10, 15 metres further behind and creating that pocket there as well. Bruin has automatically got options forward of the ball. If Reese Stanley ends up taking the mark in this example, he is going to be able to either wheel and go and know that Geelong is set up behind the ball, or he'll hopefully have some runners behind him. You think of Zach Guthrie, you think of maybe even Mark Blitzarves, who can do pretty much everything at this point in time. Mitch Duncan, Tom Stewart, these guys that are going to be able to take the handball receive and know that Geelong are still set up ahead of the ball. But what about if they don't win it? Well, if the ball comes to ground, and I'll show the defensive stats in a minute, Geelong are able to be sent up behind the ball that they are not going to get scored on all that much. Geelong are currently the most difficult team in the competition to score on when they themselves turn the ball over. 
if you're able to force a turnover on Geelong, they are the hardest team to score against. Therefore, their defensive structure allows them to attack you. And when you think of outside of the St. Kilda game, the fact that they've been able to put 96 points on the board against the Crows, 106 on Hawthorne, they know that they are able to get and go because the blokes behind them are already awesome. Now, if Reece Stanley, in the example that I used before, gets outmarked, the next kick is either going to be in the corridor, and Geelong are already a top four team at protecting the corridor anyway, so that's going to be a problem, or if they make you kick down the line, they're going to be fine with Collar Jasney, Sam DeConing, Tom Stewart, Zach Guthrie, these guys, Jack Henry, down back as well, being able to win the ball back or have a contest. Geelong are also not conceding a whole lot of marks inside their defensive 50 either, so getting easier shots against them is relatively difficult. In fact, the team that I would say have found the most success in taking marks inside 50 and creating separation was actually that round one game against the Saints, especially Tim Membry. Now, one of his goals probably should have been a free kick 20 seconds before that, but he was able to get really good separation. It's something the Hawks couldn't do before the rain came down. And it's something that Adelaide and the Bulldogs could do from time to time, but not really consistently across the four quarters. But their meters per disposal and their ability to take territory, the Cats, is unmatched at this point. Now, their contested mark numbers, their expected scoring plus minus, their offensive one-on-one -on -one and marks inside 50, all being high or elite. That is how you get the points against your opposition. It's how you score. And they're doing that beautifully. Now, the expected scoring plus minus is a stat that I think a lot of footy fans are kind of going to go, oh, expected. You're expected to kick goals. Exactly. You are expected to kick goals. But if you're able to kick goals from places that not many other players in the competition are kicking them from, you're automatically going to be ahead. And the Cats are able to do that. They are able to kick beautifully at goal. Even someone like Gary Rowan, who isn't in the side, has been able to kick clutch goals at times. Tom Hawkins, in my opinion, is one of the most consistent, beautiful set shot goal kickers of the last 15 years, along with Josh Kennedy and Jack Gunston would be in that conversation, but his last four or five seasons have been a little bit more iffy, but Hawkins and Kennedy, in my opinion, stand alone in terms of set shot, with Jack Raywalt probably stiff not to make that little list themselves. But Tyson Stengel is able to create goals out of nothing. Ryan Myers rarely misses. Brad Close is an underrated goal kicker, in my opinion. They are able to punish you at a maximum level, whether they're getting the ball inside 50, taking contested marks, or the ball is hitting the ground. Their expected scoring might be a little bit low, but they're putting points on the board, which, again, like they didn't do against the Saints, but they did enough to win the game. They're coming off the back now of a 95, 96, and 106 when it comes to their scoring. So the Cats are doing beautifully once the ball is going inside 50. They're also sixth for score involvements. And what that means is that they are able to set up really good offensive chains because every player that's involved in a score gets a score involvement, which is why score involvement numbers are so ridiculously high. So if multiple players are touching the ball and ball movement is really efficient and most importantly, not broken up, more players get score involvement stats. Therefore, they go up. You think of Jeremy Cameron against the Bulldogs on the weekend. Yes, he kicked two goals four. So there's six score involvements there because they came off his boot. He also had six more, which is extraordinary. And we're going to talk about him a little bit later on as well. But their efficiency in being able to score is compensating for a midfield that is going just well enough to support everywhere else. And there is a couple of players, but one especially I want to point out in that midfield group that I think is getting a bit maligned by Geelong fans, but he plays the most underrated role, and that's Brandon Parfit. Parfit is playing the defensive midfielder role beautifully. Now, the downside to it is he can do the Tom Mitchell hat kick and his disposal efficiency is a little bit low. But why Tom Mitchell and Brandon Parfit are working in an AFL world where guys like Matt Crouch are just not getting the job done and why Adelaide's midfield is looking a lot more vanilla than a Collingwood or a Geelong's is simply because he is willing to not let an opposition player walk out the front of the stoppage. He is usually the last line of the midfield defense and you will not get through. The reason why North Melbourne, Hawthorns, and even Adelaide's at this point are struggling so much, and I'm also going to put Richmond in this category, although I think Jackson Ross did a really good job of this in the game against St. Kilda, 
is that they are letting opposition teams walk out of the front of the stoppage. It is my pet peeve when it comes to a lot of midfields, especially my Hawks, considering that, yes, Will Day is not there. They have a 196-centimeter Irishman who is really, really good at tackling, who just doesn't do it, which is frustrating. But Brandon Parfit is playing that role beautifully. Teams are not able to get effective meters gained with their legs, when they get clearances. So yes, the Cats may lose clearances. They may lose them by a lot. They had 14 less than Hawthorne in a six-goal win. Where did Hawthorne's clearances get them? Pretty much freaking nowhere. So it doesn't matter. Effective clearances and driving out of contests with your legs are more important. And the Cats, whilst they're not necessarily doing it themselves, they're not letting you do it either. So how are the defensive stats going? Well, you tell me. Look at this. They are second for intercept possessions and tackles. They're third for rebound 50s and defensive one-on-one -on -one win percentage, or I think I actually think that's loss percentage, so they're not losing them in a massive way because you can nullify or neutralize one-on-one -on -one contests as well. They're extraordinary numbers. They'll just get the ball off you, simply put. If you get the ball, Geelong don't care because they know they'll get it back, whether it's through their pressure, whether it's through their stuck tackles or through their intercept game, and they'll also take the ball out of your forward half. So no stress. Geelong are one of the teams, and again, I put GWS in this category, and I put Port Adelaide in this category as well, and I nearly did a video on them, but I feel like Port's expectations v Geelong, which is a little bit higher, which is why Geelong got this video, is extraordinary. They do not mind that you have the ball. And if you're good enough to punish them, they'll still get you next time, which is why that 90-90 to 90 game against the Western Bulldogs, while, yes, was really close, they were happy to take the ball off the dogs when need be and punish them when they needed to. Yeah, Bont, Trelaw, and Libba were extraordinary, especially Libba. Didn't matter in the end. Not really. 18 clearances Libba had. I can't remember two of them in a row where he drove out of a contest with his legs. Didn't do it. And the Cats knew that at some point they would get the ball back, which is pretty extraordinary. And they're also fourth in one percenters as well. So they're willing to get their hands dirty and do the things that may not uh, show up on the stat sheet. I should say, and still get the ball back. Their offensive game and defensive game is in humming right now. And as someone who barracks for a team that hates Geelong, I don't love it. As a footy analyst and a footy fan, I do love watching them play, which is very oxymoronic. I understand that. But the way that they're able to put this together is extraordinary. And I want to talk about three players in particular who are making the magic happen. Now, I could talk about 10 blokes, so please don't put in the comments, especially if you're a Geelong fan, I think this guy, I think this guy, trust me, I probably agree with you, but to save this video going for 35 minutes, I'm going to narrow it down to three. Let's start with Grian Myers, who at this point in time is so far a lock in the All-Australian team, it's not funny. He could miss a month and he would still be my half-forward flanker at this point. Now, knock on wood that he doesn't because even though I'm a Hawthorne fan and he plays for Geelong... I don't like seeing players injured. I'll never advocate for that. Now, yes, he is averaging just over 22 disposals, but he's also having 22 pressure acts. And the fact that he's able to do both things is extraordinary. In fact, here are his numbers for the year. So 372 meters gained and seven score involvements, 4.8 marks, basically round that up to five, and one and a half goal assists. So whilst he's not your 26 and three, although he's had a 26 and two game, this year, so amazing there, whenever he gets the ball, positive things happen in the forward half, which is amazing. Now, that goal, uh, that kicking action, I should say, well, it is his goal kicking action as well, but his kicking action, at this point in time, we just expect it to hit the target, which if you look at it, biomechanically is insane, which we like, but he's so good because he's so annoying. If you don't barrack for Geelong, you will hate watching him when he plays your team. And there's no other higher compliment than that, to be honest, because he's, he's little, he's mousy, the way he kicks the ball is stupid and we hate it, but I mean it in the highest compliment, because my God, I'd do anything to have him in my team. Every time he gets the ball, no matter where he is, and his ability to push up the ground and then work his ass back is extraordinary. He's just fantastic. I cannot understate just how good he is. He is the best pure half forward in the comp. And for me, it's not even close. As someone who has talked up a guy like Dylan Moore and the fact that his 2022 campaign or three campaign from memory was extraordinarily good, Grian Myers has blown that out of the water. He is what every high half forward wants to be. 
I think Alex Neil Bullen is doing a very good job for the D's. Then, but Grian right now is S tier. Alex Neil Bullen is A tier. And the rest of the competition are trying to find someone who can do the same thing. And I promise you, there's not many out there, if any at all. Now, someone very wise said that Jeremy Cameron could be the GOAT half forward if he was played differently throughout his career. And right now, he's probably my other half forward flank in my All-Australian team at this point, because unlike everyone else who's doing a rolling All-Australian team, putting Christian Petrarca on the half forward flank is downright lunacy. So can we just stop doing that? Would be awesome. But look at Jez's numbers for this year. 18 disposals, 7.5 marks, over 7 score involvements, 418 metres gained for what everyone keeps saying is a key forward. He's having nearly five shots on goal a week. And look, he's not the most accurate guy in the competition, unless he's 50 metres out, of course. But three and a half inside 50s as well. His ability to work up the ground, work back is awesome. And don't forget, and this is why I say that I could have brought 10 guys into this conversation. Tom Hawkins is not the next guy that I'm going to talk about. But having him in the front 30, He's so important for what Jezza can do. And the fact that Grian Myers and Brad Close and Ollie Dempsey, and I've loved what I've seen from Ollie so far in 2024, the reason those lads are able to get around the ball as well is because Tomahawk is able to bring it to ground and also engage his opponent back shoulder. No one is leaving Tom Hawkins to go and affect another contest, which means these guys are getting one-on-ones and they're good enough to win them. And Jezza, he's a freak. The last guy that I want to talk about, and he was the man who was in my Geelong positive prediction, and that is Max Holmes, who is being played off a half-back role, which I really do not mind at all. But he's also doing well at stoppage clearances as well. But here are his numbers for the year. So 22 and a half disposals, five and a half of them at ground ball gets, five score involvement, 540 meters gained, over six marks, and two and a half clearances. Now, those disposals, I think, can go up a little bit. If he's around that 25, 26, 27 mark, he's just one of the best players in the competition. Apparently going to be sought after in a $1 million a year kind of deal. I have no idea why the hell he would leave Geelong at this point. Maybe do a three-year deal. But why? Now, Geelong aren't going to offer him a million bucks. But also, it is Geelong. You're out of the Melbourne bubble. Still Victoria. I don't see a reason why you'd leave so I don't think he will, but his ability to take territory, not only by foot or by hand, but with his legs, with ball in hand, is so important. The best rebounding teams in the competition are able to do it with their legs as well. What about the Giants? Lockie Ash can do the same thing. Connor Iden can do the same thing. Lockie Whitfield can do the same thing. Max Holmes is doing it for Geelong, and the way he is able to generate scores out of the back half, along with guys like Zach Guthrie, Jack Henry, and the like is extraordinary. And if you want to throw a couple of more names in there that I haven't mentioned yet, Tyson Stengel has been awesome. Ollie Henry is probably going to kick 50 goals this year. In fact, they could have three guys with Tomahawk, Jezza, and Ollie kicking 50 plus this year. I loved what I saw from Toby Conway and hope we can see him more throughout the year. And every time Mitch Duncan gets the ball, I have a sense of calm, inner peace. I'm like Poe from Kung Fu Panda. Did anyone expect me to bring him up in this video? I didn't when I wrote the bloody thing. But also, I want to give some credit to Chris Scott, the way he was able to out-coach Bevo in the Bulldogs game and the way he's able to systematically make the Cats better, seemingly at every turn with only couple with only a couple of down years, I should say. With 2015, the Cats missing the finals, and 2023. Apart from that, the Cats have been pretty much fantastic throughout his entire reign, and he hasn't got the list he was, well, effectively gifted in 2011. But as Kevin Sheedy once said, you never really understand how hard premierships are to win until you win them. So a massive credit to him. But if I can leave with a little bit of pessimistic does in here, Geelong haven't won a fourth quarter yet, and that might be a problem. Are they running out of gas? Maybe. At this point in time, it hasn't affected them, but how will they go in the next month? We'll find out. So have I jinxed the Cats? Probably, but they do have North at GMHBA this week, so if they lose that, I will take the blame. But this is how good they've been this year, and they are definitely a flag contender for mine. How have you seen the Cats this year? Comment below. Let me know. Is this what you expected of them, or have they shocked you as well? If you subscribe to Daz Talks 40, please click the bell and click all to get notifications for when all my videos drop. Your support means the world. I really enjoyed putting this together and deep diving into the Cats. 
stats. I like doing these team dissections and hopefully YouTube can recommend you these videos so you guys can keep watching. You can follow me on TikTok at Daz Talks Footy as well. You have been amazing. You get the three votes for this video. Geelong can get the two votes and I'll happily sneak one in there. Have a fantastic week, guys. Round six is hopefully going to be an awesome one. Or round five, I think it is. Or six, whatever bloody round we're up to at the point in time. I think it's the sixth week of footy, but round five. Good grief. I need to get out of here. See you, guys.